simulator that have been part of as a group, which is done for the study of COVID, for the study of the spread of COVID-19. One, so before I get started, let me first mention my co-conspirators. Right, the slides not moving. Yeah, my the, my the entire team. This is joint work with a, a huge group of researchers from IASC and TIFR. The IASC group led by Rajesh Sundaresan from the ECE department and the TIFR group led by Sandeep Juneja uh, and others and several others with students, postdoc and faculty from the computer science, uh, from the STCS, uh, from School of Technology and Computer Science in TIFR. We've also been supported by SAP towards building some of our online simulators and from inputs from various people as part of our project. Even that actually acknowledged my uh, collaborators. Let me also mention a few uh, thing about the collaborators. When Shiraz actually approached Sandeep for to give this talk, the, Sandeep suggested if he or one of his colleagues from TIFR could instead give the talk, since we've been sort of splitting each of us as giving a talk. We've been giving this talk at several places. So Sandeep asked this, and one of Shiraz's comments was. That's fine, that's okay, but make sure the person is not too cautious and is willing to jut his neck out. And then I was asked by my collaborators, specifically my TIFR collaborators, if I'm willing to get whacked. And so here I am, sort of a lamb to the slaughter, so I, I'll be giving this talk. So let's get started. So where are we right now? We're in the middle of a crazy situation. We so sort of go oh, hmm. So something unimaginable half a year ago, we had the, 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 the COVID-19 disease which started off in uh, started off in China, China, Wuhan around now, towards the end of November last year, slowly spreading out to various parts of the world. India saw its first infection on, I think, Jan 30th. And by March 12th, we had our first confirmed fatality. So the numbers were still pretty low in India, whereas Western, various parts of the Western world, like Western Europe and US, the numbers were really exploding in March and April. But India has been seeing a steady growth, and over time, we soon the numbers have been increasing. And by right now, we have possibly gone to the other country with the fourth largest number of cases, uh, just behind the United States, uh, Brazil, and Russia. And if you look at this plot from the WHO dashboard, notice that one thing worrying about the rate of growth in India, the growth of rate of growth in India is considerably lower, has been considerably lower than other places in the world, which peaked much earlier. But India still, unlike several other places, India and Brazil, importantly, are things which still seem to follow the exponential growth, unlike several others which seem to have had a tapering. So we'll come to various parts of this later on. So let's look at India specific statistics. So we are a population of about 1.35 billion people. As I mentioned, the coronavirus, the first confirmed uh, case was uh, the end of January, Jan 30th. The first confirmed fatality was in March. And since then, as of today, going by statistics from the COVID-19India.org website, they have about 40, 450 thousand confirmed cases, 14,000 confirmed fatalities. So this is the countrywide statistics. Despite it being the countrywide statistics, one thing very specific to this one, this has been largely most of the spread of the disease and the fatalities have been limited to our huge urban centers. For instance, there have been large outbreaks in major cities such as Aron, Mumbai, New Delhi, Chennai, Ahmedabad, Kane, these, in fact, these five cities which among the five top cities, these among them account for more than 50% of all the confirmed cases in India and close to 60% of all the fatalities, the confirmed fatalities in India. The government, as a preventive measure to suppress the growth of the disease, has imposed lockdown, have imposed a lockdown since the end of March. So we had a, a rather long lockdown, all of which have been we've been experiencing since the end of March, which been relaxations of the lockdown from mid-May onwards and slowly they've been restrictions have been lifted in at least the less affected cities since first June though the lockdown has been officially been 
relaxed since 1st June. There have been sort of various forms of restrictions in these various places. Some cities have restarted the lockdown. For example, I think Chennai is back in a very strict lockdown. So these are the sort of statistics for, so the main centers have to be bombed this one. What we'd like to first say is, well, how serious is the COVID-19? All of this seems to be panic news. Is it really as serious as one does? So for this, let's try to compare it against statistics, the US statistics of COVID-19 versus the US statistics of some other respiratory disease, say the influenza. So if you look at it, the cases wise doesn't seem as bad as influenza, but the mortality ratio seems to be fairly high. Despite it, just this is COVID-19, we have just the figures for just the first six months of the year, whereas influenza, those are the mortality rates for the entire year. But even more than mortality rate, what is actually more troublesome in a pandemic such as the COVID-19 is the exponential growth. So there's a rapid growth in the number of people being affected by the disease, infected by the disease and the number of fatalities. It's been such a rapid growth that it's more in several places as we have seen already, for example, in Italy and all, the existing infrastructure, the medical infrastructure is unable to keep pace with the progress with the growth of the disease. So what we would like to understand in some of these studies, where the modeling comes, is we'd like to understand how is the city, how is the infection spreading? How does it meet? So that it, we would like to understand how does it meet? Does it inundate the healthcare system? We want to make sure that it doesn't go because then they're going to be unwarranted. They're going to be deaths. Of course, they're going to, in any such pandemic, they're going to be a lot of deaths. But we also want to make sure they're not unwarranted death, deaths because the medical facilities don't one in a country like India with fairly uh, in uh, with uh, the medical facilities such as in India, we just want to make sure that. Is numbers on the right for US that you are showing for COVID? 2.1 uh, million, 1% of that is not 100 selection. This needs a lot of echo. Can you repeat your question part again, please? Sorry. Okay, it's not a good point, but I'm quiet. Okay, so some reason I, I, just, I just get a lot of echo over here. I'm not able to pass anything that was said. Come on, yeah. So maybe uh, may I can say if uh, there is a lot of uh, noise, maybe people can write their questions in the chat window. Okay. Sorry about that. So I just could not make out questions. So yeah, if please chat windows, I think Rishi will keep looking for these questions and he will pause me as and when the questions come. This was, I could not hear. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's yeah, I think continue. it was very noisy. Okay, so fine. Go ahead. Let's continue. So what we want to understand, so there is COVID-19, what we've seen so far, both in India and elsewhere, there seems to be an exponential growth. But what we want to model is the growth of this disease under various circumstances. So in particular, the goal of such a project is to assist policymakers to make informed decisions in these difficult circumstances. This is a very difficult position to be in as a policymaker because there's a trade-off between. So we currently don't yet have a vaccine or effective treatments for this. So we have to rely on non-pharmaceutical, non-medical or what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions to basically to buy more time for us to extend this to, to ensure that the disease doesn't grow as rapidly to spread time to meet the load and to shield the more vulnerable population. So the natural way to do this is via extended lockdowns. But extended lockdowns come at a huge cost. As we've seen in India, they come at a huge economic cost, a financial cost, a social cost. And so there's a hard decision to make. So such models do help policymakers to compare various potential strategies about how to proceed with the lockdown, how to relax the lockdown, how to ease the lockdown. This is one of the reasons why one would like want to model an epidemic during the epidemic. This one. The main thing is we would, because we don't yet have a medical intersection mentioned, we would like to buy more time so that our healthcare system can handle the load as the disease progresses. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why we want to model. But the moment we come to model, one, we have to be careful that all models, as one of the famous statisticians, George P. Box said, all models are wrong. 
the thing is, if you expect models to be correct, that's a fallacy. In fact, most models, if you expect them to completely model the truth, certainly this is not the case. What you want from a model is it is it useful? Is it illuminating? It does it help you to do this? And more importantly, as a, a scientist who is working on these models, we want to find out in what what are the situations in which the model is actually wrong, both wrong in which we are fully aware of wrong, which we don't know. We would like to understand what is importantly wrong about this. And as I described, the various models of COVID-19, including our own, I will try to capture some of these points. We do understand these models are not complete. They are not going to model, make an exact uh, picture of the existing situation. But the question is, are they useful in trying to capture about how the disease is going to spread, how the infection is spreading in, okay? So given that, this is going to be in the broad outline for my talk. We'll start with a very brief introduction on what we know and what we don't know about COVID. It's going to help us to do towards the modeling. Then we'll get into hands dirty and we'll look at some types of epidemiologic models. We'll start off with some of the simpler models, the SIR, and more progressively more involved ones like the SCIR, the SCIR++. And then we'll move on to the agent-based model and the need for simulation in these agent-based models. And then we'll come to the the main part of the talk, which is I'll go into describing the IR agent based city simulator and then discuss finally specific studies that we did for the city of Bombay. That's going to be the broad outline of my talk. So, what do we know and what do we don't know about COVID? By the way, this is based on my, I'm not I'm far, far from being an expert. This is just from a very cursory reading of this, which is so. What we do know is it's, it has fair similarity to the SARS disease, SARS pandemic that happened in about 20 years ago in 2002-2004. It seems to be a similar uh, virus that's spreading it and in, as in that case, it's also zoonotic. It's supposed to have come from non-humans to us. It has a high R0 ratio. The R0 is between 2 and 3 which accounts for this large exponential growth and it's been primarily a respiratory, it's an infection that's been hitting us, hitting the respiratory organs of the patients. It's been primarily being transmitted through respiratory droplets, through the eyes, body, nose, and mouth. This is what we do know about COVID-19. And what we know that we don't know reliably yet are several of this. So there was one, for example, early on, there was said that they might, the infection might sort of weaken in hotter climates. We don't know this. There's also been a lot of uh, talk about does, it, does the infection spread via surfaces? What we do know is surfaces do carry uh, surfaces do carry the virus. Surfaces touched by the uh, positive individuals do carry the virus. But are these surfaces have they contributed to transmissions? We still don't have conclusive evidence to this fact. So we only have circumstantial evidence of what's called fomite transmission. Is everyone susceptible? Are some of us more immune? Do we have a bet? This one it's unclear. There's a different population. Seem to there's a Severity seems to be different across individuals. We yet don't yet understand this. And there's an even more tantalizing thing is, is there asymptotic transmission? Previously, it was said that it was felt that there's hardly any asymptotic transmission, but recent reports seem to suggest actually there is a fair amount of asymptomatic transmission. That is transmission from infected patients who haven't yet developed symptoms. And there's also, we, what we also don't fully understand is the fraction of asymptomatic uh, infected uh, uh, members in the population. And for this, they've been recently, they've been in a large part of the world, including several cities in India, they have been sort of serology tests, antibody tests, and these try to estimate the number of people who have had the infection. And these, the, the, range, the numbers ranges are huge. It's between 5% to 80% of the population. We still don't know how large is the asymptomatic spread of the disease. And finally, do we gain immunity to it at least in the short term after we get the disease. This is also something for which we don't have a conclusive answer. So these are things which the uncertainties about the disease that we will have to live with at least right now when we are modeling COVID-19. So given this very brief thing about what we know and what we don't know about COVID, let's get to some of the epidemiological, mod epidemiological models. This one. Let's start with the simplest model, try to see the, we'll see why it's such a nice model that it captures these sort of pandemics very nicely. And then we'll understand in what, try to understand in what sense it fails to capture what is importantly wrong about it and try to make an attempt to address 
this one. So this is what's called the SIR model. Model is SIR standing for uh, susceptible, infective, and recovered, and removed. Removed including both. So the model basically is a system of this. It considers the population as a closed system of n individuals. The system of n individuals. And each individual is belongs to one of these three buckets. The individual is she is either susceptible, she is infectious, or removed. Removed includes both recovered from the disease or uh, deceased or died from this one. So it's a closed system. So we always have this this one. So the sum of all the th these three buckets is n. It's a total population always. And we say start off with the infection. Let's say i zero number of infections. We're going to look at the spread of the disease over time. And so what are some modeling assumptions made in the SIR model? We'll assume, so the one thing we can understand that we think of it as a huge population, N is a large number. So each individual has uh, makes some uh, has, has contacts with a constant number of members of this population. Population is of size N, but each individual makes a contact with say constant number. So it's a very sparse graph with the, of these N nodes. You have a, you have a, you have a, the, I'm talking about the node on which each vertex is an individual this one and it's a very sparse graph. We we'll sort of homogenize this this one and say in, instead of looking at it as a sparse graph, we we'll look at it as everybody is connected to everybody, but people meet. So people typically meet a constant fraction of individuals in a given day, which is independent of n. So in one way of modeling this, it sort of states that every person meets another individual with probability alpha by n. So probability individual A meets another individual B happens with probability alpha by n. n is the total population and alpha is some number which is the uh, contact rate. And this, we'll, let's homogenize this and assume that this is independent of all other meetings. That is each, these sort of meetings between any two ha happen independent of other ones. And furthermore, when two people meet, there's a probability that and one of them happens to be infectious and the other susceptible. There's a probability P that the infection will pass from the infectious person to the susceptible. Thus, the effective contact rate is sort of alpha times p, which we'll capture by the parameter beta, which is going to be one of the main parameters of this one. The beta is sort of the effective contact rate. It is the probability when a susceptible individual gets the infection. And in addition to this, so this is one parameter of the SIR model. Another parameter of the SIR model is the removal rate. At what rate are people getting or what rate are infection infectious people getting moving to the removed stage so this is called new for covid 19 studies seem to suggest this is something like 0.1 per day so given just these two basic parameters it's just beta and mu these are the only two parameters of the model we can now given this uh, assumptions we can easily set up the system the system is just this uh, ds by dt the rate at which the susceptibles is decreasing is going to be minus beta i the uh, beta i times s by n. The number the rate at which the removed is increasing is mu times i. And given that it's a closed system, the infectious has to be in increasing with exactly this ratio. So these, given these assumptions, these three, uh, this differential equations immediately play it out. And now once you have such a simple differential equation, we can try to solve it as with the initial condition, say i0 is something, and with some setting of beta and this one. And the nice thing about this model is that cap it's a very simple model, but it captures several of the features of uh, such a pandemic growth. For example, look at this graph. It talks about the, the, the red line talks about the infected, the blue is the susceptible, and the green is the removed. It talks of spread of the disease. And this is just a, you can solve for such a system very easily. This is the, the graph plots a specific case when beta is 0.2 and mu is 0.05. The advantage of this model is it's, it's, it's an extreme, you can solve such a, uh, this one extremely fast. It's deterministic. The most important aspect of it is it's, it's fast. It's independent of n. It's only linear in time. It's a numerical solution, and hence it's one. This is one of the reasons why the SIR model. You have seen a lot of. Once you have a model tailored for a particular place, you can extend it to any other place because this is independent of n. So this is, this is the nicety of this model. It captures one, and it seems to be this capture. In fact, you, you, similar studies were even done for the Spanish flu in 1918 when it happened in Bombay, so we know this and these, these models do seem to capture, you can find the right beta and mu which captures the uh, spread of the infection then. It's a nice model, but what does it fully capture what we know of the thing? The first 
this one, this is not just about COVID-19 in general, any pandemic like this one, does it fully capture? One immediate objection to such a model is it not all, these three are not the only three compartments in which individuals can be. The, the SIR model says the individuals are in three compartments, this susceptible, infectious, and removed. People could possibly, people could get, be exposed to the infection, but not yet become infectious. So there could be an in, incubation period. And this is what we'll turn as the, as the exposed bucket. So we'll add one more bucket to the system. And people who are exposed could either become infectious or could recover from the disease right away. So, so we have this new model. You could have a more involved disease. So it's an involved model now. This is what is called the SEIR model, the susceptible exposed infectious removed model. If you look at this, as and as we see, I understand the disease more, it, we're going to have more and more compartments to the progression of the disease. For example, you could have uh, uh, susceptible, exposed, infectious, then we could have infectious, pre-symptomatic infectious, asymptomatic infectious, then people who become infectious, serious, the in infections, the symptoms become serious enough that you need to be hospitalized, critical, disease, and furthermore, these could be age-dependent branching. These need not the rate at which this happens could depend on your age, on your gender, on your comorbidities, on other comorbidities. So this is further refinement of this model based on, okay, so you add more such compartments. In fact, such a, this one was in fact done in SEIIR plus model was done by Shekhar at all in the specific study of COVID. This is the NCSEM, a state level epidemiological model for India 220, a couple of, a month, a couple of months ago in which they studied this sort of model, a model in which you have susceptible, exposed, uh, infectious, asymptomatic, infectious, pre-symptomatic, uh, pre sorry, infectious, asymptomatic, infectious, pre-symptomatic, and then the infectious pre-symptomatic turn into either mildly symptomatic or severely symptomatic, then hospitalized, death, and recovery. So you could have this. And furthermore, they actually did study such an involved uh, SAR model with uh, even an, further adding an age stratification also to this. So these do help you do this. So you, as you understand the disease, you try to add more compartments and stuff. Question is, how well does it model Bombay? Could we do these things do more still model Bombay? Can we do this to understand how the growth of the disease in Bombay? So let's actually look at how Bombay functions. So what we're familiar with the city of Bombay. So this is the, 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 the map of Bombay in which the color talks about the darkness of the color talks of the color palette is based on the density of the pop and the amount of population. So we are out here in the south, which is one of the most sparsely populated wards in the entire city of Bombay. By the way, this is this is the district of Bombay and suburban Bombay. It's the what's under BMC's administration. This is with respect to how we stay in Bombay. But if you look at how, how we work in Bombay, you get a very, very different picture that is. The large fraction of the population does, in fact, come to the southern wards for work. Therefore, there's a huge commuting going on between you know, across Bombay on a daily basis based on where you stay and where you work. So this is one difference. So it's not as if it's a homogeneous uh, contact happening across the population. Bombay is, dif Bombay is different and several urban cities are different. I'm putting the example of Bombay just as a test bed over here. Bombay, furthermore, like some other huge metropolitan cities has the fact that there are large pockets of high density areas. There's, for in Bombay, we call them slums and chawls, in which the social dynamics and the amount of interaction people have with others is far, far more than in low density in areas such as where we live on in the TIFR campus and stuff. So Bombay has these extremely heterogeneous sort of population response. And perhaps assuming a homogeneous interaction and contact rates is not possibly the most ideal thing. What we'd like to do is we'd like to have models for each of these, not just an aid stratification, possibly based on how much you have to commute, how much you have to, whether you live in a high density area or a low density area. So you want to add these further compartments and you keep adding to it. The extreme end of it is what I'm going to call, what is the agent based model in which basically you have a compartment for each individual in the population. Each individual is a particular compartment, both comes with his, his or her own characteristics and they move from their compartment to another compartment based on this is the most granular you can go and that's what you will try to understand this. Of course, this comes at a huge cost. We have lot, the more the number of compartments, buckets you add to the model, comp more complex does it become to solve and to even understand 
can you actually understand solve the system and not so we'll try to do it so we, there's a trade off between these we want to add these things to understand to get a better understanding about how the uh, the heterogeneity in the system but at the same time sometimes these things explode so much that we don't know how to how this uh, thing progress. this might be a, it might capture the model but i don't know that's not useful in any sense because i don't know how they how to even simulate such a model so we'll come to this now so what what do we do how do we capture how do we do it on an individual level because we are not going to work with the real city we are going to work with the synthetic city so we take sort of the population information the census data and several geographic information about based on how people work how people commute where are the big uh, community centers we take all of them we curate all this data get this and we then generate a synthetic city a city a synthetic city of bombay which sort of mimics the actual city in which most of the workplace the workplaces the households seem similarly distributed as in the census data and in the demographic details that we have so we build the synthetic city and then let the so we'll call the individuals in this synthetic city as agents we will let these agents interact with each other as if they were one of us that is we'll interact in their houses in their in their households in their workplaces in their schools in their community centers and find out how the infection spreads based on these interactions so to more formally you're going to have these black circles are going to be the various individuals we're going to build a synthetic city each individual lives in a household a household could be of varying size size 4 size 3 size 2 size 1 varying sizes these individuals not only have these households but they participate in various interaction spaces they go to work they have part participate in some work spaces some of them go to schools they then go to various community centers so we sort of look at this we get this from the demographic details of the city in particular we build this sort of bipartite graph in, in once on the left hand side of the graph we have the individual agents on the right hand side we have the various interaction spaces and we connect an individual agent to an interaction space if he or she participates in the corresponding interaction space so sort of this is our synthetic model of the city so we based on the demographic of the city we build this bipartite graph capturing for every individual we build a bunch of work spaces a bunch of households homes schools community areas and individual agents and build this sort of bipartite graph on the line and we want to now understand based on this synthetic city model how does the infection spread in this model yeah so how do we now do the simulation so as i said we first gen the first part we generate the synthetic city these are using the demographic details these are the census information surveys based tell you about how much people how people commute from their workspaces to home details of public transport use so we use all these publicly available data to generate the synthetic city and in the first part and once having generated the city now we now begin use this generated city to simulate the epidemic we use with clinical studies on how the disease progresses to actually figure out how given the profile of each of these agents when they interact with each other how does the disease progress how does the infection spread on the population so we build this based on the death. so we sort of build dynamics to mimic the interactions in the various common spaces and for specifically for the city of bombay we do this we build the city has uh, 24 wards each ward we split into two parts the hygiene area and the load density area so we build a city with 40 bombay we split of 48 wards to include whether a ward is high density or low density and then do the generation of the city that's the first part in a city simulation and so notice that it has two parts to it one is the one input which you need from the demographic details of the city the other is we need clinical details about how the infection is spreading and once we have both these we'll do we we'll study how we're going to simulate the epidemic this is fine but then once we're going to ask this is this all necessary do we need to do such a thing and so first let's see what's the criticism against such a this one the first thing is we just thrown the whole kitchen sink at it it's sort of trying to simulate the entire city this one and because of this the first and most this one is it's unclear whether i can even simulate this model is it is a is a simulation even efficient in time can i do it so it's, it's clearly far slower than the scir models 
the code is usually complicated and involved, which also possibly allows for bugs in the code to come up. So when you do these simulations, you have to be careful of this. And of course, the greater fear in these such modeling is we just, because we have thrown such a huge thing as this one, we have thrown too many parameters. And of course, there's, whenever you work with these sort of modeling with parameters, you have to be cautious that once you throw too many parameters, you can possibly fit anything. These are all valid criticisms on, against this model. This model is not as simple and clean as the S model and stuff. It has too many parameters. It does this. Question is, can I still, is it still useful? Is it still illuminating? And I would want to argue that despite these valid critics of the model, it does help you to do certain things. It plays, just, it tries to understand, as I mentioned already, one of the reasons for doing this was the heterogeneity in the contacts, heterogeneity in the individuals. But in addition to that, it also allows for studying various types of targeted interventions. For example, suppose you implement social distancing among the population. Suppose you implement case isolation or home quarantining or containment zones. You can sort of, given such a model, we can try to implement it and find out what, how does the change, does it influence, does it change the spread of the infection? These are some things that are not so easily doable in the SEIR model. We we'll have to find out what are the beta and the mu parameters under these, and these currently are unknown. We don't know what's the relation of, if you bring in case isolation, how does it affect the beta and the mu in, of the SER model? We don't know this. Whereas in the agent-based model, despite its cons, these are some things which it helps. And I'm going to sort of give it to you the example of a, a small video. So let's look at this. Let's look at a, a sort of a bunny-like simulation of the agent-based model. You have a, this is not the city of Bombay, this is just a square grid in which each of the pies denotes an individual agent. They are just randomly thrown. The initial red individuals are the uh, in initial set of infected agents. And you can now let them just move around and see. You can simulate this model and find out as, people, as an infected, a susceptible person comes close to an infected, there's a probability that he gets infected and you're looking at the spread of the infection as time progresses. So this is a basic simulation that you can do in such a model. But once you have such a mo simulation model, I want to say that you can do much more with it. For example, you can ask, what happens if I now enforce social distancing in the population? How does the infection spread? You can look at, compare this. You can say, okay, you might have social, dis sorry. You can have social distancing and in the model, you can understand what the effect of, if not social distancing, even if social distancing, people possibly do have to go to a common community center to buy their da daily essentials. People might have, you might have to isolate people. If you want to isolate people, how does the spread of the infection happen? If you do quarantining and stuff, if you only do quarantining most of the time, not all the time, if the city is sort of split into wards, into smaller community zones, can you do it? So each of these, these are various sort of intervention measures which you have. And once you have a simulation model, it tries to understand, you can sort of, it gives you the flexibility to understand these various interventions. Are these interventions, are these interventions, based on these interventions, how does the infection spread? By the way, these videos are got from this three blue, one brown YouTube math channel. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a great math channel, uh, YouTube channel to look at. So this is our vanilla simulation of the, of this uh, agent model. And it tells you that these different types of interventions, the, age, the agent based simulator tells you how to use your handle of understanding how the disease spread, how the infection spreads under these particular models. There's so much about the general agent based models. So let's go into the details of the IACTA for agent based city simulator. By the way, this is a good time if anybody has questions before we go to the details of the IACTA to our city simulator. Uh, Prahlad, maybe you are going to come to this anyway. So, but uh, are the authorities using your model, like BMC or the government of Maharashtra? Yes. Are they are they using uh, your your model? So we uh, we've been talk so both so by the way so this is a joint project with IASC and TIFR. So we've been the two cities we've been modeling are the city of Bangalore and the city of Bombay. Right. These are the cities which we have been doing. Though everything that we can do can be got done for other cities also if you have the re relevant demographic details. And both both groups, the ISC group and the TFR groups, have been having conversations with the respective local administration. That is BMC in this case and BBMP in the case of Bangalore. They limited this once. 
yeah so we we do give our re weekly reports uh, we do sort of give our reports on the various types of interventions it's up to the policy makers to decide how they are going to implement these so all these reports which we are giving are public and whatever we do our reports are being given to them too thank you uh, pranav for, for modeling mumbai you you then keep track of 12.4 million different uh, 12.4 million distinct individuals in your yeah, yeah. so yeah so we are going to have so for each bombay and bangalore for bombay both the bombay we are going to have an agent based thing in which has 12.4 million individual agents in there so that's going to be the rct generator because we do want to understand yeah so let's come to those details so so when i'm going basically what i said so far for a general agent based model we look at it with the specific we been we did this for both the city of bangalore and bombay what i will tell right now is with will relate i'll relate it with respect to bombay but everything i said will all equally hold good for what we did for bangalore so we start off with take the demographic details of bombay so bombay has 24 wards and we split each wards into further into two parts either the high density component of that ward and the low density component of that ward we also have the age profile of the city from the census data the household distribution size the employment this one how many people go to school so how many people are unemployed then these are from the census data we have these details then from various surveys some world bank surveys we have the commute uh, details that is what fraction of this people in one particular ward move to another particular ward for work we do have the sort of matrix of commute distance commuting times of for the various population we take this and based on this we generate the city basically we generate the bipartite graph which i did this is for bombay this is how it was done a bipartite graph in which the left hand side has 12.4 million individual agents so it's a synthetic representation of we try to be as close as possible to the city of bombay by imitating that the the statistics that this city has the our synthetic model has is as close to the demographic details that we get from the census and other places for them is what we do pala do you also have uh, different kinds of commute uh, commuting for example some people commute by train some by taxi so we do have those train? details we do have those details i'll come to this i'll come to what we talk about public transportation we do have these details and they can be done at the model so far we haven't yet done we have done only public transportation and stuff in the model we the, but this is something which is easily a, implementable in the model so right now it was most of our implementation happened for the period of lockdown where in fact there was no transportation except for some bus service so we didn't uh, transport was not our main things on our agenda in the beginning right now it will be given that the trains have started opening trains have resumed right but it will be useful when the unlocked down starts yeah 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 so this what, how how our unlocked down will affect the yeah so i will come to the public transportation in a little bit by the way how am i doing with respect to time so it's 15 minutes 15 20 minutes more sorry you have got 20 25 minutes we started a little bit late okay sounds good 25 okay. minutes you can take easily okay 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 so this is what the this is sort of the demographic details of bombay this is how we generate the synthetic city of bombay or bangalore the case may be then comes to the that we also need to know about the study or the clinical studies so for this we use by prahlad yes uh, there was a question earlier about uh, gender differences because the disease uh, progression is different in yes but yes. male and female yes and do you have those details in there also no at so, that time you didn't early on so we still don't have gender the details into our model it's easy you can once i when i come to it later we would these are things on the to do list we don't yet have and i'll come to why we don't yet have these gender this ones there we do notice that there's a gender does seem to play a role i'll come to, i'll address it at the end of the talk but well, our, our model still doesn't yet uh, take into account the gender differences of the individual agents prelat well, yes Uh, so in the beginning you described these uh, bucket based models and now agent based models yes but these seem to be two uh, uh, and you know two very different ways of doing things but can you not uh, can you not simulate the you know the can you not put in the same information that you would put in an agent based model into a model with a lot of buckets not a million but 
50 buckets or so. You, you, you could do it. If you want to know how much, you could do that. that or 50 buckets. Already the, I think the SCIR plus model already had, once you take in the graph, the, the graph I had shown there with the age stratification already, I think I believe that already has 50 buckets uh, over that already. You could do this. Right now we are going to the other end. Question is we don't, the, we, the point is out there in those things, you can understand given the beta and the mu's in those models, you can understand how the disease progresses. What I want to say is once you go to this individual level, now you can talk about these various interventions which you are implementing. If once, because you know, bucketed people together, I don't know how to split the buckets apart. At this individual level, this agent-based model gives you the flexibility to understand various intervention models. Like certain people, infectious people with certain symptoms are case isolated, they're home quarantined. Each of these interventions, we can sort of implement it in this extreme end of bucketing. That's what I want to, that's the advantage of the agent-based model. If we can simulate it and understand it, it's good over here. We'll, there'll be issues as if we can simulate it, we'll come to that also. But I Certainly, you can study it. The main thing is it lets you study these very targeted interventions. I see. So the discreteness is important here. The discreteness is important. Uh, no, so at least the way we implemented the discreteness is fairly important. You are asking whether the twelve point four million we couldn't have made it bigger. The discreteness does seem, yeah, it is at least the way it's. Uh, it's we, we basically break it down into a combinatorial problem and work, do the simulation. Okay, so, yes. thank you, uh, Prahlad. Yes. May I interject with one comment here? Sure. On this same point, uh, I guess one thing that you are uh, your agent-based simulations are doing, which are not there in the kind of uh, compartmental models that you described, mm -hmm. is transport. People going from one place to another. Okay. Some people traveling somewhere, other people not traveling, and so on. So that kind of heterogeneous transport is not easily captured in a... Uh, yes, the transport is not captured, but I would say this is true for any, any, any heterogeneity. For example, you sort of just say the people now begun, have begun wearing masks and you want to look at this system or you want to do it, but not all people wear masks. So you want to sort of, so the, right, the other model, you're just going to sort of, you're going to, you can now have a, a thing in which there are compliant individuals, there are non-compliant individuals, and you can understand how, how much compliance is needed in order for this. These are things which we can study over here. It might be that there might be a beta and mu that captures this, but I do not know what is the beta and mu that captures these sort of interventions. That's all. It might be that the SAR models also can, you can capture if you knew the right beta and mu that captured these sort of interventions. It's just that we don't know how to find out the, those betas and mu's for each intervention. We could come back to this point later. Just sure. uh, let's, yeah, yeah. I, I, we'll, this one. But let's let me just talk about how the the, the model. So then we need to know about the. I, I'm not. I thought I'd spend some time on this disease progression, but it should be fairly indicative what this uh, chart. This is we taken it as study from Verity at all. By the way, these are clinical studies based out of from the uh, infection studies on the infection in China from March. There have been several such studies both from both from China and from New York. Unfortunately, we do not have such studies from. India. There have been no such clinical studies. So if we had clinical data from India, it would be good because then it will be tailored to our population. Right now, we've been using these sort of disease progression from other places because we do have such studies. This sort of tells you that if you are ex, the, the, these are both based on clinical studies and some modeling studies. It sort of says a person, when he gets exposed, he remains in the incubation period. He or she remains in the incubation period for a mean of 4.58 days. Then they get infectious. They might be both either be pre asymptomatic infectious or pre symptomatic infectious. And then they either try, they might either just recover from asymptomatic infectious or become symptomatic with serious symptoms. Then move on to hospitalization if the symptoms even further aggravate and then become critical disease. And it, at any point of time, they could also recover. And furthermore, these branching also happens age dependent. So this is the bottom of model which Verity et al. had looked at. In fact, they suggested they had this mm, age-based transition between the states. These H is hospitalization, S is symptomatic, C is critical, D is deceased. They sort of noticed this sort of age-based transition for the population in China. By the way, once again, I mentioned these are, this is from studies based out of Wuhan, China. We don't have such clinical data 
from India yet. And now if you incorporate this with the age distribution of Bombay, this is what you sort of get. That is, if, out of the population of 100% of the population, if it's, if it's exposed, only 66% develop symptoms, out of which only half of that 66 symptoms are actually going to get severe symptoms. And, and much, 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 a significantly much smaller fraction, only 4%, the entire population sort of requires hospital care and 0.2 fraction actually is the fraction that actually receives. This is what happens when you compose these uh, age-based transitions that we got from China with the age distribution of Bombay. We would like to get similar studies from India. Right now, we do not have this. Okay, so now given this, how do we now do the simulation? So this was the simulation. So I Palad, can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, so you have these mean values for different things, like mean period of incubation. But there's also okay. a spread around it, right? So you are also taking spread that maybe there's a variation that symptomatic can last from maybe three days to 10 days. So, days, so five days but... Yeah, it can last from this. So all of this, they will, they will be a, they will, so they, they prop, the transition from each of this will be a random variable. These are not going to be deterministic the way the simulator is. Yeah. So, Let's see. So, so let's. I showed you this vanilla simulation which we had. So how does that work? There's a certain agents which have a certain number of. You look at the number of contacts these individual agents have in their respective interaction spaces, and whenever a susceptible individual and an infected individual comes into contact with each other, close enough distance, there's a probability that the infection might get transmitted. And you do this and sort of you break time, the entire time horizon. Say, I want to study how the infection spreads from early March to September. You break this time into sort of small time slots, infinitesimal time slots. For each time period, you run the simulation to find out what happens in the interaction, what does the infection spread, and do this for every time step. This is what one would want to do if you want to do the simulation. It's sort of funny thing. Notice that this is not feasible, as I, as I mentioned, because this involves, firstly, it, it's linear in time. I have to do it for every time step. More importantly than that is it involves pairwise interaction. I have to talk about this for every pair of individuals. And this is sort of infeasible for a city like Bombay when the M, when the individual agents are 12 point, when we have 12.4 million individual agents. So what we would like to do is move from a pairwise simulation. If you can simulate, do this, get the effect of the simulation, not by a pairwise modeling, but more by a linear response. So we go more by rate-based simulation. So recall, we had this bipartite graph between the individual agents and the interaction spaces. So we sort of, and I sort of color coded, I've done a very vanilla color, a simple color coding. The reds are the, so, so, reds are the uh, symptom, reds are the infected, uh, blues are the susceptible, and green is the, uh, green are the people who are recovered or deceased from the disease, from the infection. So at each time step, each of the infectious in agents, contribute some amount of infections to their interaction spaces. So we do one sweep from left to right of this graph. Each of the infected individuals contributes infections to their interactive spaces. All the interactive spaces, each of the interactive spaces collects the total amount of inf uh, infection they get from the infected individuals that participate in them. Of course, all of this is a, we are, it happens, we're going to, the problem, they're going to be randomized processes. And then at the next sweep, we do a, this was a sweep from left to right. Then there's a sweep from right to left in which each susceptible individual picks up the infection if based on the amount of infection, the particular interaction space he, part, he or she participates in collects in the first phase. So that's the, where the susceptible in, uh, turns in. So we do this for every single time step. There are two sweeps of this bipartite graph that happens. And so this sort of gives you a, an order n t sort of running time, order n per time step, uh, way in which you simulate this whole. So this is exactly, this is given the agents and the further how many workspaces, how many interaction spaces. You could have workspaces, homes, schools, community areas. You could now add even transportation over here as another. This one, we could do this and it will be, it's exactly what I have said now. So this is going to be the way we simulate this. Notice that once you have this, you, are, you can allow for all sorts of other heterogeneity in contacts. You can add, as just as I mentioned, whether the individual takes public transport or not, you could add these, whether they're schools, response, 
you could add based on the different high density areas these going out there you could also add features like suppose somebody has been recognized to be hospitalized he's he no longer contributes to the infection they have gone sort of sort so severity induced absenteeism that is they no longer contribute to the infection because either they are case isolated or hospitalized so you can put the add that to the system and another feature which was related to a question that was asked is what we do know is it's not true that every infected individual participates equally in spreading the infections in fact studies seem to suggest that 20% of the infected individuals seem to be contributing 80% of the infections so there are few people who seem to be more this one so we sort of model this by a heavy tail distribution about the way, when what's the possibility probability that the infectious person spreads contributes to the infection in the interactive in the interaction space that's how we model it we actually model it with the gamma distribution over there and this is how so it allows this sort once you do this sort of this one it allows for all of these heterogeneous in contacts you can do this and now given this now we're going to study various so intervention measures that we can think of on the city so for instance you can think of the no the usual no intervention or the lockdown in which the interaction in the household spaces have increased but no workplace school place interactions except for some essential services running but not all of these might be not everybody might be compliant so we might have some non compliant households where the workplace in, there is some amount of workplace interaction still and and they do still are interactions in the community level so this is one sort of intervention you can have then you can have case isolation in which the moment an individual is uh, develop symptoms he sort of isolated so this you reduce all the non household contacts for the particular individual the household contacts remain unchanged a furthermore system of this is home quarantining in which you not only isolate the individual but all uh, members of the household that he or she participates in so you could sort of do this and of course schools and colleges so these are some basic interventions that have already been done during the lockdown now we can depending on the current policy we can add any mixture of these and you know, do the same sweep mechanism which i simulation mechanism i did so Good, all of all possible combination of these and find out which is the best this one you could talk about compliance you could turn um, now add trains into this one i'll come to trains a little more and now another feature for example from april 9th onwards the state of maharashtra said wearing face masks is mandatory in public places and studies do seem to show at we don't have covid related studies but at least for all similar respiratory diseases we do know that the wear of usage of masks seems to duck reduce the transmission for example this believe that there's a 20% reduction in the transmission so you can sort of add this as an extra feature in fact we do add it in our simulation of the lockdown from april 9th onwards that a large part, fraction of the population is compliant and wears mask when step out and all of these customizations you can they are all fairly implementable very simply implementable now i'll come to two of the main things that the agent based model lets you do one is It is very specific to Bombay. One that Sorendu pointed out earlier: the trains and the containment zones. So let's begin with the sort of the containment zones. So what are containment zones? So since the spread of the disease, the government, the current policy is whenever there's a building or a society where there are a significant uh, a non-trivial number of cases, then the building or the society has been completely locked off or sealed. And furthermore, if several such buildings and a place have had this issue then the entire place is declared a containment zones and movements in and out of the containment zones are heavily regulated this is the current policy of containment zones how do we model this in our particular simulator so we sort of do it at a very localized ward level we say that in the following sense we don't yet have our thing is not granular enough to have every we don't have yet every building in this one so what we sort of say is look at a ward depending on the number of uh, uh, hospitalizations in the ward we, uh, we increase the amount of leakage containment leakage we decrease the amount of contact the if there's no if there's zero fract percentage of uh, the ward is hospitalized then there's no containment leakage and the containment leakage is decreased is is decreased as in a linear fashion with the number of hospitalized cases and once it reaches a threshold of 0.1 we say that they can't this is the containment leakage this particular ward they can't be any more 
the movement in the ward is heavily regulated. So we sort of compare three different types of containment leakage. Containment leakage is allowing for leakage of 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.1, and we can compare them against each other. Leakage of one says that there's no containment policy. It is, there's movement as usual. So this is how we model containment zones in our specific model. The other thing which people, multiple people already asked is sort of the lifeline of Bombay, which is its local trains. So Bombay cannot function without its local trains. In fact, it's known that it's estimated that 90% of the working population use trains in some form or the other to go to work. So in that sense, we are not at all a representative fraction of Bombay being out in TIFR. Now, how, do, how does one model these trains? So I'll, I'll talk about calibration that we have done in our modeling, but one thing I want to say is trains is something we don't, we, we are not able to do initial calibration because we believe that the initial spread of the disease did not happen in trains. It happened more among the population which was traveling abroad and the trains were also closed down early on. The trains have not been functional for a long time. So we do not have enough data to calibrate the spread of the infection to find out the beta values, the effective contact rates in the trains. So this forces us to actually make assumptions. So sort of right now we're working in the assumption that when people travel by trains, they sort of, depending on the amount of time they travel in the trains, they make about several, so many contacts per minute. This average of one contact a new minute and each contact will raise possibility of infection. This is what we've been working with. And we also look at various possibilities. We'll have to calibrate this once we have more data from the trains. Right now, the trains is an unknown feature. We, this is how we've been modeling trains in our uh, uh, project right now. So, so far, this is the entire model. So what I will next spend the next five minutes or so, what I will talk about is I'll talk about how do we calibrate. So I talked about these contact rates and the compliance factors. We need to find out what these numbers are. We have to, we can't pick these numbers out of the blue. We're going to fix a number. We find out what's the initial calibration details, which is the, the, based on which the entire simulation is going to be run. So let's first talk about the contact rates. The contact rates, the effective contact rates in the households in this one, how are we going to do this? So for this, we look at how the disease progressed prior to the lockdown. So let's look at this graph, which is the log the plotting of the number of fatalities against time in the log scale. The blue line plots it when it no interventions, where the red line plots it with interventions. But the red line plots the actual data. And notice that the, it more or less follows a straight line as would I expected in an exponential growth, except starting from April 9th, there's a sudden shift. It changes to a different slope. And this is primarily because of the effect of the lockdown that happened from March 25th onwards. There's usually a 14-day delay in the in the disease, in the, how the disease pro progresses. So around April 7th or April 9th is when this line defects. So what we we take the initial part of this curve, that is the part of this curve prior to April 9th, and that is going to be the way we are going to more uh, calibrate our data. And we're going to use the question is: Are you going to calibrate with respect to Fatalities, are you going to calibrate with respect to cases? Each of these is contentious, which is the more appropriate uh, are the data that we have, the real data or this one. We believe fatalities little capture the reality a little more than the other data that we have. So what we will do is we'll try to we'll calibrate our model so that the fatalities of our model for the period from March 15 to April 9th matches with the real data, and then use these to calculate the beta and this is what's going to be used for the rest of the mutation. So in particular, we're going to, we'll seed the simulator with 100 initial infections. We'll look at the growth rate for cumulative fatalities prior to lockdown up till April 9th. And flu cohort studies seem to suggest that the, these already, we have three parameters, seem to suggest that the transmissions in workplaces, communities, and household seem to be the same for sort of respiratory diseases. So we'll use the same assumption over here. Based on these assumptions, we get a handle of the initial betas, and these betas are what are used for the rest of the simulation. That's how we calibrate the betas. Then we do this. We Pralad, do uh, this plot was for Mumbai or all India? This plot, one second. This plot is for, one second, I should. I don't recall. Let me answer. I think it was. This is, this is no, this is Bombay. This is Bombay. We are exactly calibrating the city of Bombay. Yeah. Uh, I think the fatalities here was taken to be India because Mumbai didn't have this many fatalities by 
April 10th. So, but the, the initial curve sort of followed a similar trend as the India curve, but India curve had larger numbers, so there was less to Okay. For the want of time, we do a similar sort of thing for the comp for compliance. I'm just gonna I'm gonna be quicker over here. So compliance. So now once we have found the betas that we are going to use for our simulation, now we want to find out what's the compliance levels. Compliance once again is a fraction of people. We want to find out how many households are actually compliant to the intervention measures. It's not true that once you have a lockdown policy, a case isolation or mask or social distancing, that all households follow this. This you do notice that uh, they are going to be. Uh, the households that don't participate in this and what we basically did was for the remaining period we used various compliance levels to find out what's the uh, it, this is a harder quantity estimate and it seems to be that around 60 to 70 percent matches with the observed number of fatalities this one and this also seems to align with the mobility data mobility report that google releases google has been periodically releasing mobility data for each state and this one of course this we don't have Mumbai specific thing, we have Maharashtra specific because this is for a very small population, this is for the Android users that Google observes. But it seems to match with that the compliance. They tell you about number of people, now what's the number of people, what's the decrease in people in the in parks, in, in, in grocery stores, in households, the increase and decrease in workplaces. And our thing seems to match these. And one more point I would like to mention is we use. Sorry, Prahlad, we can't hear you. Just two compliance measures. Two compliance measures. They could catch you. You can't hear me? Uh, yeah, now it is fine. I think oh. we lost you. Can, you can repeat a few last few sentences. Okay, I'm also running short of time, but anyway, let's, this one's the last bit. So I want to say how we come up with compliance, this one. We just run it for various compliance measures. That is, we ask for, a, find out, uh, sort of do the compliance measures, 100%, 0%, 50%, and what we, we run it for several things. We found that 60 to 70% seems to sort of match the observed fatalities. And, and this seems to align with the mobility reports that Google has been releasing on a periodic basis for the various states of India. This, of course, it's a caveat. It's for all of Maharashtra, not for Bombay. And it's for a very limited population. It's for population that uses Androids and has their location turned on, which based on which Google is able to release these statistics. So based on this, we come up with compliance measures. And for want of time, I want to go to the plots, the more, this one. So let's skip this one. By the way, all our code is publicly available. It's it's up, available in a GitHub repository. The, the city generation is written in Python and the simulator in C++. We also have sort of a mini simulator which works with a population of 100K so that people, it's a browser based thing. It's not as, so it's a much smaller thing so it can, it's fast enough to run our browser. So you can get the link of this, of our, this one and people can play around with it. You can tailor these numbers as you want. You can talk of various types of interventions and then figure out what is it. It would be good if people try out these and check what's happening. So let's come to the actual, I want to talk about, I want to, the next last few minutes, I want to talk about the specific studies for Bombay and what are our plots and predictions for how the numbers are going to look like for the next few weeks and months. So for Bombay, we're going to look at, so we're going to look at plots. So basically, we're going to look at, we have all the intervention measures we talked about. And now the lockdown has been since mid-May and certainly from June 1st, the lockdown has been relaxed. So offices are slowly starting to operate. So it's a phased, we want a phased resumption to uh, phased opening of the offices. And we talk of two different, we're going to consider two different pro attendance profiles. That is for the periods of May, June, July, August, a low attendance profile in which the offices in May operate at around 5% capacity. This 5% is from the sort of the instructions from the, from the guidelines from the Ministry of Home, Home Affairs, which had said that certain office spaces should uh, essential things will be operational at 5%. And then we look at some in June 20%, July 33% and August 50%. That's our low attendance, low attendance uh, opening of Bombay. And similarly, a slightly higher thing in which we have 5%, 33%, 50%, 60% sort 
for the months of May, June, July, and August. And for all of these, we are going to assume that people are using face masks. The trains, we look at the trains being turned on and turned off and case isolation and home quarantine is being followed and the social distancing of elders. So given this, let's look at the plots. So we go to, this is, sorry, sorry. That's the first plot we'll spend some time is on the number of hospital beds required over the months. So what I've plotted in the blue and pink curves on the top are the number of hospital beds required for the diff two different attendance profiles. The dotted ones are the, for the same attendance profiles, but with the trains being you know, off. This is an unrealistic situation, but the, assuming the trains are being off, you consider the same, what happens when the trains are off, what happens when the trains are on. Notice the feature over here, that is there's been a growth in the number of hospital beds all the way till mid-June. And then they saw, sort of seems to be, this seems to suggest that we sort of have hit at least the local peak in the number of hospital beds required. And that seems to be sort of captured by the number of confirmed cases also. There seems to be a similar sort of, uh, sort of a trend going down. It's a local peak in the sense, this is captured by our models. So in, in what sense is it? It's a local peak, it's opened it up, but because of containment policies, uh, containment zone policy, the, the number of hospital beds re reduces. But once again, because that, there's a slight lax and hence, it rises up again. So you sort of see this oscillatory behavior because of the containment zone policy that's being for, followed currently. So this is sort of something which model, this sort of oscillatory behavior, you would not have been able to predict in another model. This model has this feature that given this, we can sort of predict this. So a good test of our model will be what happens in end of June or early July. Does it actually, does it behave this way? In that case, we have been modeling the current policies in the in the city fairly well enough. Otherwise, there's something fairly wrong about our model and we'll have to go back, back and recalibrate. So this is about the hospital beds. This is about- so Is it growing in the last plot uh, where, uh, with the trains on? I mean, there's oscillation, but is there a secular growth over a long time? So it's sort of, uh, it's going to sort of, uh, you mean to say beyond September? Is that what- Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like it's growing linearly. It's, it's sort of flattens out. We haven't, so I don't know because I don't think we ran the model beyond September. So I don't know what happens after that. I would expect it to sort of flatten out like this till other some other measures come to address the situation. So it's sort of going to flatten out and just be a plateau for a while like that. That would be my expectation, but I don't, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Pranad, one more question. Uh, uh, so here you talked about how you construct, sorry, this is going back a little bit. Here you, you talked about how you construct uh, this model with the graphs, the bipartite, the bipartite graphs, and, and, and uh, you uh, input the information about demographics and census, etc., and how many people work in offices, etc. But uh, uh, with the same information, perhaps there are, uh, you know, many uh, connectivity types that could, that could, you know, uh, which could result from the same uh, same amount of uh, same kind of input information. So and and then different connectivity types of the graphs may lead to uh, drastically different conclusions. So is is there any way you randomize over graphs? No, no. So the bipartite graph is not a fixed the graph. So all we have. So I will spend more time on it towards the end if, after on. But let, just a quick answer. So the bipartite graph is not a deterministic function of the demographic details. So the bipartite graph itself, I should have mentioned it. For example, what I, this plot which I've done is on, is basically, it's an average of 10 different runs of the simulator, five each on two different uh, instantiations of the city. So the, we get two different instantiations of the city which sort of mimic the demographic details. So it's two different bipartite graphs that we have and then five runs on each. So it's a different graph each time. Each time you initiate the city, we're not, it's not always the same city that we get. It's a thing that matches with the average statistics given by the census as much as possible. So even the, there's randomness even there in the way the city is generated. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And this, these particular plots have been done for two separate instantiations of the city and five runs each on the city. So there's randomness both in the generation of the city and in the simulation of in both parts is randomness. Yes. Yeah. May I ask a question? Uh, sure. Yeah. So uh, 
have you compared with the real numbers? I mean, the actual number of uh, critical hospital beds. So, so, so uh, the question you, is, what does the point is what we the what we mean by hospital beds here, and what so what is considered in in the current policies of what we mean hospitals over here are people who are severe symptomatic cases. Whereas policy been following till recently in Bombay is anybody who's tested positive is hospitalized. So does that more compares to the number of cases rather than hospitalizations. So it won't, it will not be, come, it'll be an apples versus oranges comparison if you want. So what I have instead plotted is the actual number of confirmed cases uh, on this particular day. So only with respect to fatalities is where the mm. two number, the plots will sort of align with each other. With respect to others, it's unclear what we mean hospitalization is not what is considered hospitalized over here. For the current BMC's uh, policy is anybody who's tested positive is hospitalized. And currently our hospitals, we can afford for it. It might change over time. I see. But is there any quantity at all where you can uh, compare? So, I'll come to, so whenever I can, I will plot it. So just like over here, the, the, the dark red or the brown one is the confirmed cases. So whenever I can, I will plot it in the plots. So okay. I'll have several plots, four to five plots more. Each of them will have. So critical beds, this is for critical beds. And the only difference between critical beds and the previous one, it's... Uh, uh, Prahlad, uh, yeah? previous graph, the one, yeah, right, this one. Uh, why is the why do you predict a very much larger number of hospital beds than the total number of reported cases? No, because hospital beds is you expect a person to be in hospital for eight days, so it will be like this should be up. This should be a scaling by it by a factor of eight or so, because it's not the number of new hospital beds that are needed. It's a number of hospital beds needed on that particular day. So it's not just people who turn positive this day, but positive for the last one week or so. Uh, but the factor is more like five, right? The factor is more like five, yes. In this case, seems to be more like five. Yeah, so the question is, in India, do people come and report much later? These are things that, yeah, so these ones, these numbers don't match. So I'll come to this. I'll come to this. These num this In that sense, this this multiplied by eight does not equal, does not exactly align with that graph. That is true. But also, once again, notice that reported number of cases also includes cases which are, uh, you know, they due to uh, let me I'll come to that in a second I'll come to that in a second so that's about hospital beds this is about critical beds then this is about the effective number of hospitalizations and here I'll address your question so here so the the blue and the pink lines are as before what our you know, simulator predict is predicting the brown dotted thing is what is the observed number of cases in Bombay and one of the reasons initially this one and then there was an Aggressive contact tracing. This one. So this includes not only people who are tested positive, but all, all, you also do an aggressive contact tracing to find. So these, so that curve slightly goes off at a higher this one because these are people who not only need hospital care and are positive, but are people whom you have found to be positive because of contact tracing. These could be asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic individuals whom you have found to be positive because of the current testing policies being implemented currently. This is one. And the one which actually will match, which we calibrated to, is with respect to fatalities. So here, the things more or less completely align, except for one spike you see. But for that one spike, on June 16th, there was a huge spike in the number of fatalities. Actually, let's come to that in a little bit detail. So, so this, is, this, this is the cumulative number of fatalities across the time period, and this is the daily number of fatalities. So there was one spike on June 16th. So there was June 16th, there was a huge, basically there was a uh, bias in the way in which uh, suddenly 862 additional deaths were, uh, BMC released, there were 862 more deaths. And they said that these were deaths because there was a report, uh, these were deaths due to, comorb to people with comorbidities and it's unclear whether they died out of COVID or they also, they had COVID and they died. It was unclear how to, whether to call them COVID deaths, but they later on decided to call, call these deaths also COVID. So 862 deaths from the previous periods were all released on one particular day. It was announced on June 16th that they were deaths. So we don't know how to account for these deaths. Are these deaths from the last one month or from all the way from March? We don't yet have this data. So till then it was aligning. So we might have to do a whole recalibration based on these dark brown lines, which are each day they have been releasing deaths, which are coming from the previous Clear time periods. So we'll have to 
once we have a better picture of it, we'll have to do a recalibration of our model to then fit. So till such extra data was not released, our model did fit well. There's been a, due to the last few days, especially June 16th onwards, the number of fatalities are just shot up. We were, that was our primary thing against which we were calibrating and there seems to be a mismatch right now because of this uh, sudden extra deaths and we need to figure out how this happens. So this was my plot with respect to fatalities. I had a similar thing to talk about containment leakages. I will skip this for the want of time and talk a few things and just summarize. You can come back to them if people are, have questions. So firstly, what are we missing? So one thing which we are missing certainly is so far in what I said so far is how we break into so many parts. We have these beta, we have, we have certain parameters, the betas and the compliance. We need to know how sensitive are these this one, we have to do a sensitive analysis. This is currently in the pipeline and hopefully we should have a report uh, out talking about how sensitive it is. And Saurendu had pointed out about the gender thing. We currently don't yet have this sort of tailored data with respect to gender. We know gender plays a role, but we don't know how this one. So we'd like to incorporate it. We've been looking at studies elsewhere and we would incorporate gender and comorbidities also into our, this one. Of course, there's other aspect that the financial and economic aspects to it. This is beyond the scope of this particular study. These are things which we know that we are missing, serious things which we are missing and which will get one. Some things which are wrong, as people said, the case, there's a huge, this one misalignment in the number of cases. But this, I believe, is because of the testing policy. That is, what we are talking about is the number of infected patients at the hospitals, serious symptomatic cases, whereas what is being done, what is declared as positive cases is based on the current testing policy. Another thing which seems to be off is the number of recovered cases. And this, I think, is because we don't have line data from, from India. We would like to get hospital line data from India to find out the progression of the disease. It seems to be the case that Indian the recovery rate in India seems to be less. Slow. The, the rate of recovery seems to be slow, slower than elsewhere. For example, in China, we'd like to get hospital data for India, for instance, aggregate line data from a hospital. We don't yet have this. This might also be to do that in India, people possibly go, arrive, go to the hospital only at a later point than in other places. And more importantly, one thing which we are currently off in the last couple of days is the fatalities. We'll have to figure out what these are due to and fix it. So I'll conclude with that and ask and take questions from all. Okay. So, Palad, can I ask? Uh... So uh, you have not included the incoming uh, infections into the Mumbai. Pardon, so, I didn't uh, know the so once the transport transportation starts, once the train start and no. the air travel starts, that there may be incoming infections also. Incoming? Do you mean to say the out? You, you, okay, by outside trains, from Mumbai. Now, uh, infected yeah. people coming in from outside. Yeah, yeah. Right now the system works as if it's a closed model within the Mumbai. So we have to take in about infections coming from outside. But for the city of Bombay, actually, we are going more afraid that we are going to be spreading the infection at least in the early part rather than getting infection from outside. Yeah, this is something we haven't yet done. So we have, we have the long distance trains are still closed in our model currently. That will have to be incorporated. Yes. Uh, Prahlad, one question, uh, if I may. Uh, so there has been a lot of uh, outflow of migrant labor from Bombay once this train started and so on. Yes. Uh, is there, and this primarily uh, was outflow from high density areas. Uh, right. Is there a way to take that into account in some of your model parameters and would that give us some insight? No. Certainly the model allows us to take that way. If we know the fraction of high people from the high density areas, if we have statistics at least some sort of surveys about how many people of these were positive and this one, but I don't think we have such details. We do no. have possibly we know how many people went out. We don't know. So we'll have to make if you want to incorporate that, it's easy to incorporate these into the model, but we don't know what data we can I don't have the starting data to work with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, you know, on this point, it would be nice to have even a rough estimate of the kind that you mentioned. Yes, How many yes. infected people went away from Bombay? Yeah, so, we, yeah, so, yeah, we, we, this is something which we haven't looked at. It's not hard to do it given the model. We haven't done it. We haven't done it. And it's worth looking at, yes. Uh, can I chip in a little bit? This is Rajesh Sundaresan from Indian Institute of Science. Uh, 
we have access to Facebook uh, uh, data. It's only a small fraction of people that use Facebook, uh, but they have been tracking mobility and they've been sharing this uh, data to people in India. Uh, and it looks like about, uh, if I remember correctly, about one and a half to two lakh people have moved out of uh, uh, Bombay. Uh, so this is the information. How many of them carry the infection is unclear, of course, because it's only whether they've moved to another place or not. So that's the rough number. Uh, so as a dip in the population, it's not that much, uh, mm -hmm. but a significant fraction may have carried the infection. Uh, 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 in your in your model, one, one, once somebody gets infected and recovers, that person cannot be infected again. Is this right? The right now, yes, that's how it is. Yeah. So, with the, with the model that more or less fits the data, what fraction of Mumbai is now uh, infected and recovered in your model? What fraction? Let me. Uh, so, Shiraz, if I may add, uh, it's over 10% at this stage, people who have been exposed to the disease. Um, Let me just stop sharing the screen. I'll just pull up the other graph in a second. Yeah. Sandeep, you can go ahead. I will just... So, I was going to say that, you know, we calibrate our parameters uh, to the data. So to that extent, we come up with a reasonable uh, you know, uh, trend forecast for the future. But as in terms of you know, what our model predicts as to the number of people who are infected, depends crucially on what the fraction we assume, what people are asymptomatic, what people are symptomatic. That we've assumed is one by a third. You know, one third of our people are asymptomatic, two thirds are symptomatic. To the extent that that number is variable, how many are actually infected is also very much dependent upon that. So in that sense, this number that you're going to see in uh, Prahlad's graph is, is can't be taken with too much of certainty. There's a, there's a randomness involved around it. So Prahlad, go ahead. You should have the number. Yeah. So, no, so this is just the plot of the number of infected people. This is also people with any sort of infection, asymptomatic, asymptomatic. This is the current, uh, what our model predicts, yes. <laughs> Wait, but uh, Sandeep said 10% uh, 10 per, uh, 10 10 percent would be like a million, right? And this is, oh, sorry, that's two million. Yes, okay, fine, fine. Thanks. That's exactly yeah. what this is saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's one and a half to two million. Thank you. Yeah. I see. And I, I, do I understand right that your model predicts more or less that we've reached a plateau now and we will continue on this plateau? I mean, yeah, unless so, something changes very much. So, so in, no, some no. Sense, in some sense, yeah, a plateau with respect to hospital cases and stuff. So some test of our model will be, in some sense, what happens end of June and early July. So our model is yeah, sort of predicting this sort of oscillatory. This is how we have modeled the containment policies of BMC, uh, of uh, in general the government. And if our model is capturing it well, this, it should say that we have plateaued right now. We have seen the peak. I mean, with okay. the current uh, kind of social distancing, with wearing of masks, containment zones, the number of people coming into hospitals is more or less matching the number of people leaving the hospital. So in that sense, yeah. hospitalization numbers have stabilized. Have stabilized. And if I translate this number to number of new infections of any sort, symptomatic, asymptomatic, sort of uh, a day, uh, what does that amount to? Does that amount to something like, I don't know, 10,000 new infections a day in your model? I where we are at the moment. Yeah, from this graph, one can infer it. This graph, you can. Uh, I, I don't have it right off the mind. I will look this up in a minute. Take the next few questions and then get this in the meanwhile. Okay, I just want just one more before. So, I mean, I, I, if uh, I, I just wanted to get a sense about how long it would be before that 10% becomes 20%. Uh, so this is visible from this graph, yeah? This is visible from the graph. This is by end of August. Uh, yeah, when, so yeah. two, three months for 10% to, 10 to become 20%. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, early August, early August. Depending on which yeah. curve we are working with, yeah. Okay, thank you. So can I ask a question about heart immunity? So in your sure. model, can you, does, does your model also read 
some kind of herd immunity after about 60% infections if we just run, make it run forward all these models will all these models will increase see herd immunity when once the number of infections it's a certain fraction of the population so can you predict from mumbai like when uh, will you expect if you things go on like this that's going to be so we are still far from that so i have, we haven't that's going to be beyond beyond september or so so at least we have, the current things we haven't yet gone on that far yeah, it sounds like you're saying it's about 10 months away, right? Eight to 10 months away. Is yeah. it sort of if you think about, no, the question is when does herd, herd immunity is at 60% or I want to know when does the, when do I stop being seeing new cases? That's the yeah. more the situation. That yeah, but the, the, say, say herd immunity is 50 or 60%. The time scale to that sounds like 10 months, set, set 10 months. Like, yes, yes. No, so but from your model, you can uh, say when the herd immunity will reach. Right, whether it will be at sixty percent or seventy percent. Yeah, you could say that. for Mumbai. Say you that. Could predict that. Right now, currently our simulations stop at September. We have done it only for one twenty days. You could you could push it for longer and find out when does the number of new cases sort of go down to close to become insignificant. Probably worth emphasizing that uh, also going to be a function of uh, what interventions are put in place. You know, all these interventions in a way are preventing or slowing infection. So if you slow them, they will delay herd immunity. Yeah, so we don't want to be waiting till herd immunity sets in. That's going to be a long while. Yeah. And so sorry, related, related question. If, uh, if, you know, if we just lifted all restrictions, does it become 100% attendance in office yes. Would the graphs be dramatically different? Yes. So for instance, this is the, the, the that's the Sort of, I didn't have any cont containment zones. You didn't have any restrictions. So this is a this is not the sort of question, not exactly the question you asked. But suppose we didn't have this containment zone policy. We didn't when buildings which had positive people with the current government, which we have a containment zone policy of having containment zones in which this monitoring people going in and out is strictly regulated. We didn't have it. So even if we had something like a 0.5 percent leakage, it seems to the number of hospital beds are well uh, around between 5,000 and 10,000. But if you don't have anything, it really shoots up. It should have shot up already by now, by the way. Yeah, no, what, what I meant was we continue with the containment zones, which I think realistically will continue. But you just allow re release restrictions on office attendance. Say. So, so economic activity can continue modulo containment zones. Pradhan, so, uh, oh, you mean to say office attendance, you make it go all the way to 100%. Yes. So, Pradhan, if I may. Uh, sure, sure. Can get, get, you know, for city to work at that level of uh, work uh, occupancy, you need the trains to function at almost 100%. Now, if you have trains functioning with about 7.5 million odd people taking them every day, we have no idea how bad the infections can be. So, uh, so I guess, I mean, that's a big worry. You know, we, we can't calibrate that. We don't really know how bad the infection will be if trains have that kind of crowding going on. Our recommendation for the city is that whatever, you know, there's no way that can open to that level anytime soon. It has to open slow because you need the trains to not be that crowded. Uh, so anyway, that, that's the yeah. so, so what kind of data do you need to calibrate uh, the effect of trains or uh, trains and buses? We are going to capture, I guess, the rise in the infection that can be attributed to trains. How do you separate that out? Um, so we, yeah, right now, I mean, it's just going to be, you see, you have an idea of what would happen without trains. You have an idea of what, what happens because of trains. That's one way to ca capture it. Otherwise, you'll have to kind of, you know, rely on BMC maybe to approach the people to try to do some kind of contact tracing to establish many of the infections, how they're happening. Can you utilize something like uh, Arugya Setu or any other Bluetooth-based app to do this? Possibly, we haven't thought about this, I guess. No, the Aroge Setu app, it does not even, I don't think it, tell, it te, does it tell you for every infection that happened? Maybe, maybe I can add, this is Rajesh here. Yeah. Rajesh. Aroge Setu app will record the GPS position of an individual only when the person uses it to uh, uh, indicate his or her health. Um, the, uh, there is no bouncing off of, so the, the Bluetooth data yeah. um, uh, that bounce off is uh, 
um, is recorded, uh, but I think it is not, the position is unclear. Just that somebody met this individual is all that uh, we have. Whether the person met in, uh, in, a, in a train or in some other location is unclear. So I think uh, Arugi Setu itself may not work, but there are some other apps which actually record the position. Uh, if those apps are used, for example, there is one uh, that uh, is being used in IISC, it's called Go Corona Go. That actually in, uh, uh, identifies the uh, location as well, uh, if the person switches it on. So that so maybe it. maybe it's a maybe it's a good idea to encourage the city BMC and such people to you know advertise an app of this kind to adopt this and then maybe uh, uh, ensure that more people use it. I think that's uh, what we have been trying at IASC. Uh, but the Karnataka State Disaster Management Authority has not uh, 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 given the consent for widespread use of this because of privacy concerns. They are uh, a little worried about what might happen uh, if this data is made public and things like that. So it somehow not, uh, we, we have not been able to convince uh, locally. At, but some institutions have adopted it, but not made compulsory ones. Yeah, it's a good idea. I think it would have uh, worked uh, and it would have given us more information. I think South Korea has this app, I don't know whether, or Singapore or South Korea, I don't know which one they had mandated it, but I'm not sure whether uh, here it will be possible. Uh, you know the people who have uh, written this app, right? So ah, yes, yes. You can, you can ask them to uh, open it up so that uh, privacy concerns can be checked by a large number of users. Uh, the the code is uh, uh, yes that's correct it could be uh, done. Um, Isn't the IAC code already? A, I think it's already public, but I I'm not sure, so that's why I was hesitant. So, but I think the privacy concern was largely with regard to Bluetooth because then basically, in some sense, it gives you it gives people an option of checking whether or not uh, there is a case within my hundred meter radius or a five hundred meter radius or something, and there was this worry of possible stigmatization and so on, uh, which is, I think, also why Arogya Setu sort of made it very clear that, you know, they do not pick up GPS data every time and that it's picked up only when that app is used at that time. Sorry, could I also ask, have, what about school attendance? Is that um, in your future predictions, have you assumed that schools remain shut, schools and colleges remain shut? Right now, we've been working on schools from being shut, but yeah, schools we will have, we will start possibly from uh, depending on how things change. Possibly from August onwards, we'll have to incorporate school attendance too. And do you expect that that will make a big difference to the curves? So um, maybe I can take the question. Uh, so uh, this is Rajesh once again. In an earlier report, we actually had uh, schools come on in June uh, and it did make a difference. If you ask for the exact uh, number, I'm unable to tell uh, because I think uh, it was a combination of several other things. We had schools on, we had uh, workplaces on. Not for Bangalore. No? Not and I, we also did it for Bangalore. Yeah. But uh, schools can be targeted and they could be opened up and we could try to see that's a simulation worth doing. Uh, I mean, realistically, so this is Sandeep. Uh, realistically speaking, I think you know the recommendation is going to be that if schools can be conducted offline, then that is going to be the uh, you know the modus operandi for the coming few months. Now, wherever they cannot be conducted, uh, uh, you know, online. Sorry, even wherever you know people have to come physically, there would have to be sufficient separation. Uh, you know, some kind of uh, staggering of classes. Uh, people coming only for a few days. Normal school functioning, I think uh, we, we can do the measurement of that, but that's probably going to lead to a fair amount of infection. I, I don't see that happening uh, in the near future. Uh, there's a question uh, for both Rajesh, Sandeep, and all others. Uh, so in the usual modeling, uh, agent-based model, schools are treated as a large source of infection. I mean, they're often given their own set of uh, part in that binary graph. Mm. But COVID uh, is also very edge dependent. So uh, is it clear how to account for that? 
like is there even data on how infectious children are or so what the are model they? already takes into account this fact that we are asking about how mm. you are asking how infectious children are we certainly takes into account about how no. possibility of how can, can they get the infection given that they come into so on, that the model already does take into account you are asking for do they, are they spreaders of infection as much as they are receivers of infection the model already takes into account you are in, in the rate at which you the disease progression based on the age of the agent i see so, so right so i just said that you know when two people meet and one infects the susceptible person we don't model age right now in that interactions we don't have information enough to model that particular part the other part when if one of them is actually a child how far and the child is infected how fast they infect others that also we don't model right now because we don't have good information on this what we do model is how the disease progresses when the person is when this person is infected that is age dependent on that we do have information so that right. is that good. right now i was just asking because covid seems to be with in that sense different from the earlier things where uh, this kind of models were had been very successful right i mean let's say it's in, different from flu in that sense and a big flu, yeah. Yeah. flu is goes through a lot through schools but we right now we don't have data to for this hmm. okay, sorry i didn't quite follow the question so the thing is in I mean, maybe just to uh, so the model sort of takes into account a certain infectiousness parameter that is there for every agent but this is not chosen based on age is that what you wanted to ask like right, right. Right. So, the children have a different infectiousness yeah. and hence schools Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that uh, we don't. Yeah, we don't have data about. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, uh, if I may uh, just add one item here, uh, the uh, the model, the contact rates in schools, even though it is not age related, uh, it's a little higher than in workplaces. Yes. Uh, that is based on flu uh, studies in the past. But it hasn't been affected. Effect. Uh, it hasn't uh, played a factor uh, because schools have been closed. Thank you. I have uh, two uh, questions. Uh, this is Arindu. Uh, one uh, one of them is, uh, and both of them are dependent on uh, data which I have been reading about since you guys wrote this model. So I was wondering whether you have already incorporated it or whether, if you have not, whether it should be easy to do it. One is uh, uh, the study of viral load. So there seems to be some support for the notion that the viral load peaks before the symptoms set in. Okay, and there's more and more uh, studies which seem to support this. So that's the asymptotic uh, thing. And apparently, from all that the data can show, viral load actually falls off slightly when the symptoms set in. So is that something that you incorporate? or? currently no currently no i i have so i the i i can add to what uh, prahlad has said uh, so it is actually fairly straightforward to bring it into our model uh, we are just waiting for reliable studies so uh, if you can share those uh, reports no, which I can indicate do. Uh, I can. Uh, when the peak happens it's fairly straightforward to include we have a time varying factor uh, it's just that we keep it constant at this time okay i can do that the second thing that I have uh, been reading, again, uh, a few papers, but uh, more support based also on parallels with uh, the SARS uh, virus. Um, there seems to be evidence of super spreading, okay? Which means that under certain social uh, circumstances, for example, when many people are gathered in one room, uh, there could be, uh, a large number of people infected. Okay, mm -hmm. the same person, if, uh, if, if such events were not there, then the same person would not be able to infect such a person. Now, this is something that I'm sure an agent-based simulator can put in, right? What is the effect? If you, if you do not allow gyms, if you do not allow, uh, you know, movie halls to run versus what happens when you allow them to run. Is it already something that you have done, or is it something that you need to do? No, no. So we haven't interact. But this is uh, like the previous one. The straightforward to implement. It's just a different interaction space where the spread is for 
this one we could do this we are i don't think we are we are not we are not doing it currently we are not doing it currently. we do do it to some level in the sense that you know person gets uh, infective we have a probability distribution so some people are far more infective than others now it's not uh, no, right. Uh, yeah, right i understand are uh, you uh, that was already said no i was not talking about that super spreading seems the the okay so there's so no super not, spreader not, not an indi- yeah. not an individual but a, a space Some yeah right spread. absolutely a space yeah so for example our canteen or uh, the tifr canteen is a, a possible super spreading site okay. because there are lots of people there and one person coughs and many people can get infected so possibly yeah this has not been incorporated we could possibly incorporate this in certain community spaces certain community spaces suddenly become more infective than cause for infections than this one this not done it's done only at the individual level right now yeah, yeah we um, uh, just a uh, maybe a clarification uh, there is we have one such interaction space uh, per ward and in uh, in bangalore there are 200 wards for the same level of population that the bmc seems to have but in mumbai there are only uh, 24 wards uh, so the number of interaction spaces consequently mumbai is a little smaller than in bangalore but we have one such interaction space uh, it could be possible to it should be possible to add a few more uh, maybe we could have uh, malls as uh, uh, interaction spaces and then a few gyms uh, representative for the number of gyms that are there um, canteens i don't know it seems like too fine grained uh, but at least a few of these could be added uh, and that could capture the super spreading events um, the way super spreading is uh, is modeled in a crowded household is something that we could adopt in these uh, meeting spaces as well we have a if 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 there is an 11 person or a 12 person household Uh, then infection spreads faster there there is a way by which it, it is modeled that could be brought in here as well um, but we have not done it yeah, it might be interesting to see this going ahead as more things unlock uh, uh, were you the question that asked were you the person that asked a question about transportation that the agent based model uh, yeah right yeah uh, so i think that is a good point uh, so the uh, sir models are just mean field models homogenizing the entire network uh, uh, there is a way by which you can uh, have a local mean field model uh, the local mean field model takes into account uh, population densities being different at different locations and instead of an ode you will get a pde when you pass through the limit uh, but then uh, all of these models don't take into account the fact that you can take infection from one ward to another by virtue of your transport either uh, the infection could spread in the transport domain in the transport interaction space or at work and so the agent based models bring that uh, important feature uh, which is uh, some sort of long range connectivity uh, in the graph that makes that takes disease from one place to another the local models uh, uh, the, the local mean field models don't tend to do that the uh, mean field model tend to overspread so somehow this uh, has a possibility to match uh, things a little better so your point is very valid about transport being modeled so if i may add to that i mean there's also this thing that we seem to what's happening in bombay seems to be a union of uh, small outbreaks in various places uh, so even though within each place things may be homogeneous it appears that taking a linear combination of different sirs with possible delays and so on they don't look like sirs at all so the curves could get quite wonky uh, is it possible uh, rajesh or uh, others that you take this local mean fields but then you connect them by uh, hopping matrix or some some sort of a connectivity matrix of course that will not look like sir the answers will not look like an sir but, but So that that would be able to model some of this. Uh, yeah, I, I'll take if I if you if I may, I'll uh, try to answer this question. Uh, I think uh, that is possible, and in fact, it has been done. Mm-hmm. And there has been one group that I know in IAC which has done this. Um, their uh, estimates are way off because I think uh, there is a difficulty in calibrating uh, these uh, mixing parameters. 
So they have taken the origin destination uh, uh, transportation data that we have in Bangalore and they have tried to do this. Despite this uh, real reality being brought into the picture, uh, the match is uh, not good. Uh, nice. Perhaps it might be a shortcoming in the local interaction. Uh, it's not clear, but they're still they're working on it. So that's one model. There is another model that has been uh, that ICMR has been uh, uh, studying. And this is with respect to uh, SAR models in cities, but then there is interaction across cities, and that interaction is being modeled based on flight data, which seems to be more. Uh, uh, readily available than uh, and then they extra they take 10 times that to uh, reflect the movement from one city to another but this was during the early part of the epidemic uh, in uh, uh, about 20th or uh, so of march uh, where they tried to understand how the epidemic may spread from one city to another uh, so uh, the so these are the two models that i know which take into account what you are suggesting I had a question about the data. Uh, I mean, I have used uh, the spreadsheet that Prahlad uh, dutifully fills in every day. Uh, I was wondering whether you guys can in get more disaggregated data because, as you said already, uh, Bombay seems to be a union of several different outbreaks, mm -hmm. and modeling each outbreak separately may be in, an interesting and important job. So is it possible to get uh, something like that? If with the data, you mean more at a ward level or? Yeah, ward level or something. Initially, they were releasing such statistics. In, I think in April, early April, BMC was releasing the case, the new cases based on the wards. But for some reason, they decided not to do that any longer. Firstly, I think there were also issues about how to, well, they did not know how do you assign a ward to a person, whether it's based on the hospital reports or whether it's where the individual stays. So there was all this confusion. So in April, they were doing it and then they stopped releasing this information. All that they release now is the number of containment zones and the number of cases in each current cases by population, by hospitals in each of the wards. That's yeah, actually, I understand. I'm just asking whether it's possible. I mean, they must have the information disaggregated in some way and whether it's possible to ask them to, you know, we could help them to aggregate it in various ways also. If, uh, and it'll give us more information about how. I mean, how certainly to, the time series of uh, infections arising in different wards, that is available to us. I mean, if we ask them, and it's also something that they are keeping track of now. Other information they may not actually be capturing themselves. You know, if, for example, fatalities in different wards, the time series of that, it could well be that they're not capturing it in this form so far. Okay, so that would be an interesting piece of data mm -hmm. to analyze. Thanks. I'll talk to you later about this then. Okay. Yeah. So does your model take take testing into account? Like if somebody is tested and found positive. He's more like he or she is more likely to be sort of quarantined. Is that um, is that taken into account? I mean, so if we increase the number of tests by 10, 10, 10 times, for instance, how will that affect the rate of progression of the disease and so on? So this so, is. Uh, go ahead, go, go, Sandeep, go ahead. Sandeep, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say this is something that uh, we are working on currently. Uh, so uh, essentially, you know, what you saw, what you heard was that we are dividing currently ward-wise. So now we are moving towards having more granular communities. So there's a smaller granular, you know, neighborhood community. There's a random kind of uh, community that each person interacts with uh, separately. And the point is, so with that more detailed model, now when somebody gets hospitalized because somebody has severe symptoms, we go to the neighboring communities and actually trace out people who are the contacts of this person. So we can actually do contact tracing and then we can have a testing strategy. Who amongst them are they going to test? And what does that mean in terms of how the infection gets uh, reduced and controlled? So this is an ongoing work that we have. I think the code has been uh, has been made, but we're just trying to make sure that it matches with data and uh, all of that. Okay. In this one is what I spoke about with the graph plots. I have don't incorporate it, but we hope to incorporate testing and contact tracing in the subsequent few weeks. Uh, can I ask a question about uh, the parameters of this uh, model? I mean, in the sense that uh, I understand that the, in the initial uh, calibration, you you need you use some 
the data from China to get the beta and mu and such uh, parameters. No, and no, no. Okay, okay no? go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, so sorry, I didn't catch the last part of the question. So there, so I'm trying to count the parameters. So there, there are some parameters which uh, uh, where the uh, you know the um, this SIR like parameters like the beta and mu, which for which you use some data from Wuhan in China. Is is that right? No, we didn't use beta from Wuhan. So I'll tell you what we used. So ah. the demographic details are all completely Bombay. This once, what we did use some things from studies, clinical studies from China is the way the disease progressed. This, and in particular, the transition across the states, the age-based transition, age stratified transition from symptomatic to hospitalized, hospitalized to critical, critical to death. This is China, this one. This is what we had taken from clinical studies primarily coming out of China. The rest are all local. This nice. one. So the is there some, is the there some... were inferred from this. Mm -hmm. The betas were given, given the demographics of Bombay and this, these two pieces of information. We then did calibration to uh, to figure out what the betas with, what the betas would be to so that it matches with the fatalities in the pre-lockdown period. I see. That is how the betas and uh, mu's were fixed. There was yeah. Yeah, yes yes. Okay, so the, so these are these are these are two parameters, and then uh, later on uh, when you talk about uh, you know office attendance. And uh, you know the uh, whatever other uh, gatherings and so on and so forth. So there you have to use some parameters as well. Yeah, like yeah here, like lower attendance versus higher attendance and so on. So here you have to use some parameters again um, because there is no data that can there is no hard data that can tell you what the effects uh, are between lower and higher attendance. So right now, this is just what this is. We are not. This is an input. We are saying if the offices run at these percentages, this is how the disease progresses. And we just compare different types of attendance profiles against. Are you having for dinner? But but you need. But the, don't you have a modeling here? I mean, how how do you how do you generate these different different graphs? No no no. So this. So no, once you know the attendance profile, you know the workspaces are, people are going to participate in the workspaces with so much percentage. Otherwise they don't participate. For example, the works, so in the bipartite graph, which I had mentioned, workspace will no, will no longer contribute. If it was 0%, this, these edges no longer contribute. So the edges exist based on that. The profile de determines uh, what will, what's the participation. The, each person participates in this with the probability. It's thirty percent, forty percent, whatever the attendance profile. That's the you. These edges will get erased out otherwise. Oh, so the, your model is a, the edge is there or not there, or is there is there some bond strength? Is there some bond strength of this edge or something like that? I mean, right now the right now the way it's been, I think the, the attendance profile is just got by the fact that if you have if you want so look at the number of edges that go into workspaces. If you want to say thirty three percent. Workspaces basically randomly thirty three percent of the edges are retained and the remaining are passed out. So in fact, it's done the. I mean, basically every individual will toss a coin. I mean, every individual who would typically go to work mm -hmm. will toss a coin with the attendance profile that's currently available. And if the coin, if the coin turns out to be heads with the right probability, then he says, "Okay, I'm going to work today." Otherwise, the person won't go. Yeah, so this actually happens. So by the way, it's independent. Of what I know, what Prasad says, it's independent for each edge. You independently decide whether to keep it or not with that probability, and it and you do this for every time step. Hmm. I see. That's how we've been incorporating it. And how, 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 how robust? I mean, so you you do one you do one simulation uh, using your coin tossing, and then you coin uh, toss your coins again, and then do another, and so on and so forth. So there'll be a spread of uh, your results and how uh, so are the so these are the mean these are the mean curves that you have so I have if you look carefully at the curves there is around each of these lines there is a shaded area so ah okay i see so that's the minimum the, the, that's what so the, the, the what the dark part is the mean but we plotted the error this one for the, the 10 different runs that we have i see i see Okay, it doesn't look like much. 
yeah surprisingly very few even though we have a lot of parameters very few parameters are actually tuned to the uh, data um, that we get on the ground uh, so the tuned parameters are the contact rates at home mm. contact rates at work um, then the contact rates uh, the in the community place. sorry uh, the contact community contact. in the community and then uh, the starting point of the infection uh, 100 uh, infections are seeded but when do we seed them uh, there is one more parameter which is the compliance factor Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, these are the only five parameters that are tuned. Nothing else. Other there are so many other parameters, but they are all fixed to whatever we get from census, whatever the clinical uh, trials uh, indicate, and so on. I mean, some things that we do uh, assume that we say that okay, you know, if there's a lockdown, seventy-five percent of movement in the world. We're not. Uh, we're not. You know, we're just taking a judgment call on that one. The seventy-five yeah. percent seems reasonable. We're not. But uh, no tuning. No. No tuning. Not calibrated. Okay. Thank you. One. One big question. Why is Bang? Why in your models is Bangalore doing so much better than Mumbai? What is the big difference between the two? Why there's so much, such fewer cases? So maybe I can uh, take that question. I think uh, we have had. Uh, significant uh, contact tracing for every infected individual um, uh, the uh, number that i am hearing is uh, uh, about 15 to 20 have been tested for a, for every identified case um so uh, so, so your question is uh, in our model why, why do we uh, not see uh, as many deaths as in bangalore so i think he hasn't shown the bangalore plots Uh, if you let the uh, disease go uh, in an in an unintervened fashion um, bangalore has only about uh, a, a little fewer deaths than than mumbai uh, that's the predicted numbers in the in the no intervention case but with the intervention i think the early uh, stoppage uh, matter um, i think that's probably one reason why there is a, a significant so it was still in the random phase and uh, the better contact tracing it got killed but in that random phase we we see significant uh, significantly slower growth and so lockdown came and uh, uh, ensured that it was uh, limited in mumbai some so lockdown that, came when when there weren't too many infected people yes when, when, when the number of there were too many, too many infected people the other uh, possibility is a guess uh, the uh, compliance factor in bangalore seems to be higher uh the the one that we use to match the curves than in mumbai so if the compliance is poor then the infection spreads so that might be another reason. so these are speculations so uh, and is that related to mumbai having more high density areas uh, uh, we have factored the mumbai high density in but i didn't hear your question clearly uh, could you repeat it no, 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 no. i would imagine that compliance is also lower in high density areas ah, that that has been taken into account yes it could be but but the compliance by the way the, i think the mobility reports do suggest mobility reports and also anecdotal things of comparing reports from bangalore versus bombay compliance seems to be far better in bangalore than in bombay other thing is that the compliance in uh, sort of high density areas is also because of several other factors for instance from our definition compliance should mean that people don't access shared places or they don't access it that much but however in high density areas they may not have access to i mean they would have they would be forced to access public bathrooms and so on so even if they are compliant per se i mean they still interact with the community a lot lot so in our model we assume a slightly lower compliance to account for this right okay so i guess we are almost out of time uh, does anyone have any more questions ubamanyu i think you had some question you had raised your hand hey uh, yes and so uh, my question was uh, about uh, how sensitive is the long term behavior to the initial numbers 
uh, if I recall, Sorendu wrote a paper some time back. Uh, he can tell us more about it, arguing that there could be a huge uncertainty in the initial numbers. So, given such uh, huge uncertainties, uh, how would the uh, final curves look, and uh, 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 exactly where would things go? I could take this uh, question. Could this is Rajesh here. Yeah. So, uh, if lockdown had not been uh, in place. Uh, hmm. the, uh, initial, the, uh, um, the initial number would only, um, th there is some initial randomness phase. Uh, I think uh, that, is, uh, that, that stochastic phase will essentially delay or maybe advance the uh, takeoff. But once it uh, takes off, uh, pretty much it follows the uh, trajectory. At least this is what we saw in many of hmm. our uh, uh, no intervention uh, simulations. And the final mm. settled value uh, is roughly the, um, uh, the herd immunity value. Uh, so we are not uh, seeing that much change in where it gets settled. But when it gets settled, there is some delay because you see 100, there is initial stochasticity. Uh, the time mm. when it gets to 1,000 is random. Uh, so there is stochasticity there. But you could hit uh, this initial phase with the lockdown uh, at different stages. And uh, that could widely um, change the uh, outcome of the uh, uh, infection. And I think may, uh, we got a little lucky in Bangalore when we possibly uh, hit it a little earlier. And uh, we also contact traced in a significant way. Plus, there is better compliance. In Mumbai, it is my feeling that uh, you had a little bit more, the load was more, and you also probably... Uh, 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 brought in the lockdown a little late, plus your buses were still on um, during the lockdown period, if I remember correctly. So uh, uh, I think that can change the outcome uh, significantly. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, I think Upamani, yes. was, was your question also that, you know, the data that we are calibrating our model to, if it turns out that yeah. that was wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You there know, was more in line. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, for example, so crucially what we see in, for India is that, you know, initially in the no intervention period, the doubling period was once in four days. The numbers were doubling mm. at that rate. And that mm. slope is what we are calibrating our parameters to. Now, if it turns mm. out that there was major miscounting going on and doubling was actually mm. was faster, mm. then our numbers would change. But I see. by and large, we expect that number to be, you know, that's the number which kind of, differentiates one country from the other. Yes. When there's no intervention, infections are kind of unchecked growing. How, is the, hmm. how are the fatalities happening? That could be different in different countries and that kind of tells you why countries differ. Uh, I think we are, that those numbers seem to be reasonably solid for India so far. So you've not really had a reason to kind of change them too much. But again, but I, all I of the numbers are being, the... yeah, sorry, I'll just complete that. Yeah. All the debt numbers are being uh, re-evaluated by BMC right now. So <laughs> we'll, uh, including the March numbers and April numbers. So we'll look at that and that will be informative for us, I guess. At that time, we'll be able to see. Huh. So depending on how these 862 extra deaths, if they go all the way down to early Mar March and April, then that will have to be, then we'll have to recalibrate our betas. In fact, I think they do say that, you know, that 862 actually accounts for deaths all the way from March 15th. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, they haven't yet told us how it is spread. They just said it's all the way from March 15th till June 15th. Uh, but to be brutally oh, honest, uh, we have actually tried to do the same thing for uh, both Wuhan as well as New York. So we have built city models for New York and uh, Wuhan. And uh, there, when we tried to calibrate to the slope, just as we did for uh, Mumbai and Bangalore, uh, the slope is much faster there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, our predictions seem to be uh, way off. Uh, so uh, the number of fatalities is uh, uh, a few multiples than what uh, we actually saw in uh, uh, Wuhan as well as in New York. Yeah. Uh, uh, so is it number. conceivable that uh, if the uh, initial estimation was uh, some an underestimation by uh, maybe uh, uh, an order of to reach the plateau even quicker uh, than uh, anticipated? 
uh, if it was an underestimation, we would be uh, calibrating yep. to an underestimated value, and we would uh, the B, the contact rate would be smaller, and yep. it uh, we would basically say that uh, a plateau or the infection uh, Hello? may not spread that much. That's what we would have uh, indicated, given that the lockdown has happened. Hello? Sorry, yeah. was I audible? Uh, I could hear. Yeah. Okay, I think we are running out of time. Maybe it's uh, time to close that discussion. Uh, if I can ask just one last thing. So I think uh, looking to the future, there may be a vaccine may be coming. Uh, and I think it is also a good question to answer whether what fraction of population should be vaccinated or whether there are particular areas which should be vac vaccinated first. Is it possible to answer these kind of questions? But these like, look like good questions for us to keep in mind and try to answer. We have some time, I guess, in this. <laughs> okay, I guess I think uh, it's time to maybe close the discussion. And uh, thank you, Prahlad, for a wonderful talk and everyone else who participated. I think there is a clap function in Zoom we can use to clap. Uh, I don't know if it works or not. Where is that? Okay. If we go to reactions, ah. we can clap. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, I guess, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Palad. And well, I think uh, first uh, online colloquium was a success, and I think we will keep having online DTP colloquiums. Uh, and I think with that, uh, uh, Goodbye, everyone, and we'll end the meeting. <laughs>